Tuesday, we do Who Gets It, Who Doesn't on Mackie and Judd, daily Minnesota sports entertainment. And uh, I'd, I'd love to start you guys off with a man who, after reading his quotes and seeing his press conference last night, I think really gets it. Anthony Edwards. All right. He said two things that stood out to me. Number one, I don't have the first quote in front of you, but it was something along the lines of, you know, we're... We need to stop pretending like we're the only three players on this team, referring to him, Cat, and D'Lo. Let's get let's get our teammates involved. Let's it was great. It was a very wise old sage thing to say. Mm-hmm. And then he followed up and said, This was a wake up call for sure. Lock in. Lock the bleep in. <laughs> Everybody coming in here thinking it's sweet. We're playing the Pelicans. They whooped our ass. Now backs on the wall again. We gotta wake up. I love it. And it kind of like sometimes towns will say things like that, but I don't know. It, it, it always feels a little bit out of his personality or control, you know, especially when like, if, if you were to take this quote and translate it to towns, the problem is, dude, you were one of the guys that didn't wake up in the first half. You were too busy throwing temper tantrums, right? To, to be locked in and, and beat a team that's coming back to, to get one on you from losing the other night. The other thing with Anthony Edwards, so it was kind of an off night for him. Like, he had an amazing third quarter, but the other three quarters were very pedestrian, and he didn't get the ball as often. Two points at the half. No field goals at the half, Phil. Yep. So he had kind of a kind of a weird night and still winds up with 28 points, nine rebounds, three assists, a steal, and he shoots like 45% from field goal, uh, 36% from three, he went four of 11, which, you know, it's about league average. And he, and he made all four of, uh, of his free throws and, uh, and he was pretty active defensively and, and off the ball as well. Like when you can have kind of a, a night where you basically are non-existent for three quarters and still get your 28, nine and three, like this dude is still scratching the surface as a leader and as a player. And even in a loss last night, everything about it, like his, his post game comments, everything, just like this, this dude seems to get it. If you're Chris Finch this morning, despite the loss, you are thrilled, right? Like you are absolutely thrilled. Um, this is, and, and just to be clear, I am not comparing them as players, okay? But this is like young Kobe stuff, too, because Ant's not bleeping around here. You know, Cat's thing is when Cat goes to a mic and a podium, it's a stream of conscious. So Kat's going to say what he's thinking, and he's often going to say what he thinks he should say, which is totally different than than a guy who has the look. Ant has a look that you like say, okay, I get it. It, feels, com- it feels congruent. Like what he's saying com- is who he is. Ultra competitive. Um, he just gets it. Like I, I would often say, in, in fact, to, to this entire segment that we're doing right now i I would often say that when cat talks he doesn't necessarily get it he's just saying things to say things um yeah it feels congruent and it feels like a young kobe it feels like a guy who is like all right i watched a year of this crap and by the way i love this i watched a year of this bleep i'm not gonna watch this again and i love the fact that after like a pelicans loss and you're two and one that it didn't take a 10 game losing streak for ant to, to say well this has to stop yeah it took one not good performance by the entire team i'm with you i think he gets it and i love how this kid is wired love it and they're gonna have like i just like they're gonna i want to set the expectation last night is gonna happen like 10 or 15 more times <laughs> like they're not just all of a sudden a 50 win team that's figured everything out and you know they're like they're gonna have games like that and um you know, I, I do think back to, and this is not an apples to apples comparison yet, but it's a Timberwolves comparison. When Kevin Garnett was young, he came in when he was 18, and came in when he was a young 19, right? And uh, KG showed some fire and some passion in a limited role in his rookie year. But when you're that young and every all of your coworkers are like 25 or 30 years old, they're older than you are, and you're a freaking teenager still, yep. it's hard to come in right away and be like, I'm the leader, right? You're kind of you're gonna you're gonna observe. You're gonna spoke when spoken to. You're gonna sort of fall in line, and then by like year two, year three, once you start to figure out, oh yeah, that guy that I was deferring to as a rookie, oh he's just a role player or he's kind of a stooge, and so this is my team now. 
I don't care if I'm 10 years happen, younger, right? What work environment? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, Huge, and I so mean, I think yeah. Anthony Edwards probably spent some time last year thinking, oh, I mean, I'm not going to overstep my bounds. I'm a 19-year-old rookie here. I'm going to show a little personality. I'm going to speak my mind a little bit, but now it's year two. Now he kind of knows that, oh, Kat, I love Cat, but Cat's not like the driving force leader here. I love me some Malik Beasley, but, I mean, he did pull a shotgun on a family at a parade of homes. I don't think it was a shotgun. Gathering. I think it was just a, a okay. you know. Oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> I think it was just a handgun, was okay? Let's, I think yeah, I'm going to yeah. lead the team now, all right? So, all right, so Anthony Edwards right. seems to get it. Dex, I'll keep the, I defer yep. to you. I'll keep the Wolves train going. I'll say who gets it, and it's Patrick Beverly. So we briefly touched on him at the beginning of the show about what he means. I think the Wolves have lacked this guy for basically, yeah, since KG left. Because I don't want to say their entire franchise because KG was a hard ass just like he was. And KG was more of a prominent player. But Pat Bev is this role player that the Wolves have lacked. After the game last night, Patrick Beverly told reporters, he says the Wolves disrespected the game tonight. And when you disrespect the game, <laughs> this is what you get. Dude, End quote. Pat it. Bev injects that quote into my veins. I mean, Dude. when you look at like other sports, AJ Pierzynski, right? Even like Nick Swisher, guys who are just buttholes to play against, but at the same time are really, really good players for their own team. Wild fans can't stand, can't stand Gabriel Landeskog, the captain of the Colorado Avalanche. You put Gabriel Landeskog on the Minnesota Wild and all of a sudden he's going to be your best friend and you're going to be rooting for him. You need guys like this. And Pat Bev too, he's not just a, not just a guy either. Like the last two years with the Clippers, when he was on the court, he was a plus 10 and a half in 2019-20, plus 9-1 when on the court last season. So he's a positive player as well. It's not just, oh, he's a, he's a Ryan Reeves, Judd, like from, from in hockey, where he's just a goon and he's nope. going to make a mistake every once in a while. Like, no, this is a good player on the court and what he means off the court to the Wolves mindset, this franchise is needed forever. So Pat Beverly absolutely gets it. So when, when Pat Beverly says, we disrespected the game and this is what you get, I think he's referring mostly to Carl Anthony Towns and D'Angelo Russell. Oh yeah, because yeah. I, I think I think he's referring to just the way like Russell's inefficient night and just jacking up shots out of context of the offense. Mm -hmm. And I think he's referring to Carl Anthony Towns just losing his mind in the first half and helping contribute to you know such a deficit. And the question now becomes: Okay, can those guys learn and bounce back? Or will there be some friction? Remains to be seen. The best part about Pat Bev, though, is that I guarantee you that he was not sending a message. He will tell them personally, too. Oh, and that's the best part. He was so, telling them. I mean, you you, you heard him right. say something to Cat in the moment last night. He's not, like, mad and telling the press so, so that the quote gets out. And then Cat says, is that talking about me? I guarantee you he went to both of those guys after the game, too, and said, this is BS. Yeah. This stops well, and and he's also fun to watch. He goes around bumping guys on purpose, mm -hmm, like dude. stirring stuff up. It what is he did with that, so fun. Yeah, that moment where Va Valanciunas is at the yes. free throw line and Beverly <laughs> Beverly just goes why he like he like walks up to the middle of the line and crowds Valanciunas' space and just puts his hand on his knees and starts chirping him, <laughs> and then they get into a little little yes. shovey match or whatever. It's like when. When, when if I'm watching you know NBA on TNT two years ago and I see Pat Bev do something like that on the Clippers, I'm like, who's this clown? Like, why is he? In yep. But now that he's on the Timberwolves, I'm like, yes, it's great. this is amazing. Get under his skin. Yeah. And and even there was a moment. I know the exact call where where Cat was, and equally so, he was. He had every right to be pissed. He set a screen, and it was yeah. like even even me being you know well I'm the basketball whisperer. I called Jada McDaniel's. Even if you, if you see that screen, you're like, what what more? What? How the, in the hell is that a foul? And I believe immediately as Cat starts pouting, Pat Bev comes over and basically probably tells him, "Just move on." I know it's a bad call, but move. Like you can tell he's yeah, trying he to tell him, "Move it, move it on, dude." I know that sucked. That's a bad call. You can't just keep whining about it. Yeah. That call, I'm pretty sure, like Cat's antics, you know, four or five times leading up to that. That's where the human element comes in, especially with an idiot like Ed Malloy. Like, and I can't remember if Ed Malloy made that call on that screen or if it was someone else on the crew. But like, they were looking to slap Carl Anthony Towns on the back of the hand because they were sick of his antics. That call doesn't get like that was such a weird out of context oh. call. 
completely yeah. unnecessary. And it was a terrible call. And during the commercial break, Cat went up to Jim Peterson on the Wolves broadcast yeah. and was complaining about the call. And uh, I don't know if Jim Pete said this to Cat, but Jim Pete told the audience when they got back from commercial break, yeah, Cat came over and, you know, had some things to say about that call to, to me. And I would just say that you can't complain about every call. Correct. You can't complain Correct. about every call. I love him. So the second Jim part Pete of that gets it quickly as well, though, is Cat. So the team, opposing teams, seven years in. Opposing teams know that they can get to Cat by bumping him, fouling him, um, not with huge hits, but Leaning they can into throw him, him yeah. off his game. If I'm Pat Bev, here's what I tell Cat. Take a foul at the start of every game and make it count. If if Valanciunas is going to, and he's a big dude, I get it. But if he's going, because he is going to test you until you push back, mm-hmm. so drop him. Now, and I don't mean with a punch. I mean with a hard foul. You, like, like, if, I'm, I mean with a knife, yeah, yeah. A shiv. <laughs> yeah, if you go out there with your basketball shiv. <laughs> no, but if you, but if your cat and they're going to do that, and you are going to probably get called for a, a uh, foul pretty quickly at some point, make the foul count. Send a little message. Send them. Well, I mean, that's the only way that you're going to get guys to back off you, Be, because cats, cat is. I guarantee you this one. Cat is perceived as being soft. Well, and, the and he'll start. He'll get start complaining, and then his game is all out of whack. Yeah. Well, mentally he can be soft because he gets thrown out of his game, right? And like, but he, it's funny because last night Cat disappeared, foul trouble, thrown off his game mentally, and because he's such a ridiculous talent, he goes for 32, 14, yeah. and seven, like, and he makes all eight free throws. It's like yeah. that's amazing, and he blocked a couple shots, couple steals. Like he was incredible when he was finally re-engaged in that game last night. What I would tell him, I don't know, I mean, I, I kind of like your idea. Listen, you need to physically fight back a little bit to uh, even the score. Okay. What I would tell him is take pride in them trying to follow you and lean on you. Sure. And just take it. Just ta- like, take it, but fight back at the free throw line. Fight back by getting an and one. Fight back by maybe delivering a hard foul if needed without getting into foul trouble. You know, I think... I think we're, the reason I keep bringing up some of these great players in recent NBA history is because Cat is that talented. Like Cat is one of Cat might be one of the three or four most physically gifted, talented seven footers that's ever played in the NBA. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. one of the greatest three point shooters of this generation, and he's seven feet tall. <laughs> it's like he's it's like Steph Curry and Clay Thompson are on one tier, but he's like on the second tier of three point shooters. He shoots like forty percent, mm-hmm. and the other great players like the Kobe's, the LeBron's, right? It's not that they never complain to officials. It's that they go into games knowing, all right, I'm going to get hacked. I'm going to go into the paint. It's going to be physical. Guys are going to lean on me and try and cut corners because they can't guard me. And I'm going to deal with all of it Uh and still get my 30 points and say bleep you, right? Like they go into cyborg mode. And the cat, the reason why they're hanging on you is because they can't guard you embrace it love it taunt them back for it right but don't complain to officials as often as you do so and i guess by, all of this is to say that cat doesn't get it <laughs> and by and by not complaining you'll get the calls yeah they'll start right. to give, give you the calls all right who gets it you guys we are two days in to our shows for this week and we are largely ignoring what is going on at huntington bank stadium Damn one of right. the great I'm back rowing the boat. One of the great turnarounds in Gopher football history. You lost a bowling game. Play the Rouser. You're back. Three in a row. <laughs> there, it there it is. Three in a row. There we go. Play the Rouser. Maestro. Conduct the orchestra. Row the boat. All right. Who gets it? <laughs> Any running back on the Gopher, Gopher's depth chart gets it. Any running back, I again, any if, if there is a student right now who thinks to him or herself, boy, it'd be fun to play football, I encourage you, sign up for PJ Flex team and volunteer to be a running back. Because let me give you the laundry list of players at that position so far for the 2021 season. And there's still, what, four, four games left, or five games left, I think. All right. Without completing a game, he got through less than a game. Mo Ibrahim rushed for 163 yards and averaged 5.4 yards per carry against the Buckeyes. 
He got hurt. Unfortunate. A lot of people said, what are Gophers going to do? Moe's hurt. Oh, season might be over. Hmm. Trey Pot steps in, rushes for 552 yards, and averages 4.9 yards per carry before he got hurt. Season done. Oh, boy. Trey Potts is out. Moe's out. <sighs> boy, it's going to be tough. <laughs> Who's up next? Hey, Kai Thomas, come on down. <laughs> Kai Thomas rushed for 139 yards and averaged 6.6 yards per carry on Saturday. Um, so that's it, right? Oh, no, no, no. Kai came along with his friend to the party. His name, Bucky Irving. He rushed for 105 yards and averaged 7 yards per carry <laughs> against the Terps Saturday. Anybody who signs up to be a running back on this team gets it. Yeah, let's get it. Let's get it. Iowa. Most impressive win. Iowa loses to Wisconsin on Saturday. The Gophers beat Northwestern. Very doable. The Big Ten West has one team in sole possession. Fire it up again. Dude, I mean, come on. Think about it. And, all right, not to be Buzz on, Killington man. here. All right. Not to be Buzz Killington here. Got to run. Because the, bowl, the Bowling Green loss doesn't impact at all whatsoever your Big Ten standing, which is good. This is correct. But I think if the Gophers had just taken care of business against Bowling Green and then, you know, you, you had the big road win, big. I mean, Colorado's not very good, but, like, you smoked them 30 to nothing big, on the road, right? It was a big win, literally. Yeah, and then, you, and then you beat Purdue, who beat Iowa. Like, Purdue's a competitive team. I know they lost this last weekend. You know, you'd be a top-20 team for sure right now with one close, pretty close loss, competitive loss to Ohio State. And I think, I think you'd probably be, like, in that 16 range in the rankings right now if you had taken yeah. care of business against mm -hmm. Bowling Green. So I don't know what the hell happened there. I'm Peach, I'm Bowling Green hasn't won a game since then. Um, that game still stuck in my craw a little bit, but nice win against Maryland. Not me. Not me. I am all in now. <laughs> Rolling the board. <laughs> Offensive line dominance. <laughs> Dude, Who needs? A, they literally don't use their quarterback. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. And, ima and then imagine if they had like a dynamic mobile quarterback that could also run and maybe throw a pass once in a while. It wouldn't take that much to find someone that can throw the ball like Tanner Morgan, which is not very well. Can you find someone that can be passable throwing the ball that can run for a hundred yards if needed? You know, like a dynamic mobile can there, dude. Can their guy that that c comes in to run? Not really. Do it. Yeah, he he's more mobile than Tanner. Was short. It's a lot of short yardage running yeah, situations. Yeah. They they use him to get like three yards, you know. Three yards um, of cloud of dust, baby. It's old, so. old school Big Ten. Old school Big Ten football. A lot of teams <laughs> running the ball. Successfully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the Rose Bowl is the Rose Bowl is not incorporated with the college football playoff this year, right? I actually don't know. I can't remember what the bowl games are. Because if it's are. not, and it's J January one. Mm -hmm. Declan and I were talking about this. You know, we're going to have a <laughs> choice. Winter Classic Rose Bowl. Yeah. I mean. It's not going to be a choice for Phil. Well, no. He'll, he'll be not, all in. Cracking. It's not a he'll choice for me, but it'll be a choice for you guys. Yeah, yeah he'll be he'll Well, be he there. can basically drive yeah, to Pasadena. He'll, he'll walk from there. Yeah. Where he can walk there. And you know, I'll tell you, Federated Insurance is a proud partner of Gophers Athletics. Too. Fired up. He get him fired up for Federated. Four one more time. Federated okay. is a proud partner of Gophers Athletics. And they are here to help you guys, you business owners out there, with risk management. That's what they specialize in for over a hundred years. Risk management resources, tools, people that can help you guide and navigate your business. Find out more at federatedinsurance.com. And remember at Federated, it's our business to protect yours. All right. Who gets it? Who doesn't? Garrett Bradbury, man, hey. just doesn't get it. So in 2019, <laughs> Pro Football Focus had him dead last as a pass protector among centers. 2020, dead last among pass protecting centers. Ugh. This year, we're seven weeks in. He's second to last in pass blocking among centers, what? according to Pro Football Focus. He's improved. He has improved. That is a fact. He's improved. Yes, that is a fact. It's quantifiable. He, he is. His agent can go into contract negotiations and say, "My client has improved 
He is on the rise. He went from 36th to 35th from 2019 to 2021. I, I don't, at, at what point, you know, I'm not saying they have amazing options this year. People are saying, well, why don't you put Wyatt Davis, third round pick at center? Mm. Um, I don't know. I, I th- There aren't many options that can be worse than Garrett Bradbury when it comes to pass protection. He's been more passable in the run game. Um, but I guess at what point do you just throw in the white towel here? Like they're going to, they're going to need a new starting center if this keeps up for 2022. So yes, he just doesn't get it. I think you throw it mm. in now. Like, mm. I, I mean, yes, yes. You don't have, and Mason Cole must not be good. Cause like if, if he could play, I, I would think that he gets plugged in, but I, I, a I think for Arizona. Yeah. I think you throw in the towel now, as far as saying it didn't work be, because here's the problem with him. Br- Bradbury isn't, getting bigger like ordinarily i'm serious part of the thing is you're like okay dude you got to put on weight right like you got to put on weight because you're going up against uh three techs and nose tackles who are mammoth and athletic now and bradbury sort of just physically stays the same so i think you've got to right now be planning for 2022 for how you're going to replace him and it's Mm. just a bust and it's too bad because it's a first round pick at a position where ordinarily you don't invest first round picks, but it's a bust. It's not going to change. So I'm just, uh, so Mason Cole here, since we're on the subject, according to pro football I think focus, he's a better guard than center. Yeah. I think he graded. He's up been, he's, he's graded very poorly <laughs> in pass protection in all three of his years. Uh. Um, I don't know. I guess, I guess what I'm looking for here is can someone move the needle a little bit in that department? Because Kirk has been so great when the yep. pocket has been clean this year, yep. and he's been so bad under pressure. He hasn't thrown a ton of interceptions, but like he's he's only averaging like four yards per attempt under pressure. And, and we'll talk about this more on Purple Daily, I'm sure, with Alex Boone today. But like opposing teams now are going to be hyper focused on pressuring Kirk, probably up the middle. Right, that's the weakest link. That's going to be the main thing defenses try to do here. And so if Mason Cole can just be like. A couple pressures better per game, even I would consider it. I would consider it coming out of the bye. Mm. I don't think they will. Mm. No cowards. Mm. No. Mm. First round pick. A lot of pride there. <laughs> All right, who gets it? Who doesn't? I'll go with a who doesn't get it theme, and I'm going to borrow one from uh, our sport, my sports dad from yesterday. The Vikings trust at their depth at cornerback. They do not get it. They do not get it if you don't make some kind of move. Let me get this right. You're really going to trust Harrison Hand, maybe uh, Chris Boyd, maybe even Mackenzie Alexander to step in and play more than he's supposed to. I, th- th- this, is, this is worrisome if I'm the Vikings. And I know the Vikings defensive line has done a great job. Number one pressure rate. They, they, they're phenomenal. They've been great. And maybe Harrison Smith is able to step up and, po- and possibly make a big time play for the first time this season. But the Vikings' trust at their depth at cornerback, I think, is concerning. Pat P has been a nice player, but now you take that chain out of that cog, and all of a sudden, those chains look weak, man. And I, I think they definitely have to address something. I, I don't know if it's mortgaging a first or second or third round pick, but yeah. you have to do something to address the cornerback position because you, you're gonna you're gonna be getting torched against these opposing quarterbacks in the month of November. I mean, if you're gonna address it, address it with a second round pick, third round pick. I mean, I I, I stand by what I said on Purple Daily yesterday is if you're just gonna trade a six round pick for a guy, he's gonna get lit up too. So I mean if you have tangible solutions, both of you guys, then I'm all for it. But well, I, like Xavier Xavier Howard moves the needle. Yeah. If I you want to trade for Xavier Howard, I'm all for it. So the problem is this if if this league basically just required two starting corners. I might back off, but it requires three. And so now, and like odds are one of those three is going to get hurt at some point. Um, Dantzler's gotten hurt a lot. It feels like Breland goes down once a game. And so, yeah, I would just, it. it's a depth thing too. And with Peterson, if I thought Peterson was really just going to miss three games I might be like I'll back off a bit but I don't buy it 31 and a hamstring and and plus if you rush him back you know what you know what he's done because he's going to get hurt again so and unfortunately unfortunately um he's going to be hard to replace because he was playing really well like I was impressed I I thought okay he's older it's and 
he he's not great still, but he's damn good, and he knows the position. He he is n- not the fiery type of guy, but in some ways, he's a Pat Bev type in the fact that he like brings a knowledge to the field that that secondary outside of uh, Smith last year one hundred percent lacked. And I feel I felt like he he could calm things down, and that's probably gone for at least a month now, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I think really. You just gotta score thirty plus points, which well, you can I'm all for in these next few games. Teams. Just go out score some I said teams. That, yeah, you got the firepower. You're Love not gonna it. be able to do it the way Zim wants to clamp down. Let Kirk so, cook. All right, that's who gets it. Who does oh, it? Oh wait, here. I got one more. I got my last one. Okay, go quick. Can I please yeah. chime in? Yeah. Uh baseball. You are the World Series <laughs> starts tonight. Astros and Braves are marquee event. And what surfaces on Sunday? The certainty of a work stoppage on December second. You're, you're still talking about this? This is still a... My God. Here's the thing, and I don't mean to be disrespectful. I don't think anyone cares. No, but I'm just saying, like, if you are a marketer for baseball, you have to assume people care. Like, you, like that's your job to assume. And two days before your marquee event starts, you have... <laughs> the World Series is coming up on Tuesday, but coming up next, we're going to talk about a certain work stoppage on December 2nd. Are, are people talking about the work stoppage now? I saw an article came out. There's a lot I, feel, of, I feel like it's going to be a... written about it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is part of baseball's problem, though. No one cares. Like, no one's going to watch this World Series. This is going to be this is going to be the lowest rated World Series in the history of baseball. I'm going to watch some of it because it'll be fun. But, like, no one cares about the Braves. Okay. If, you asked, if you asked America, hey, like the average American, name five players in this World Series. Just five. There's 52 guys on the rosters. Can you name 9% of them? I bet you... I don't know if I can. Five percent of America at most would be able to name five players oh, on these teams. I can. Bagwell. I can five. Five. Okay, I can do five. Biggio. Yeah, Bagwell. Biggio. On both teams combined. That's Jeff what I'm Blau- saying. Jeff Blauser. Dale Murphy. <laughs> Chipper Jones. Bob Horner. Nixon. Andrew Jones. Exactly. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's no problem at all. Bob Watson. Mm-hmm. Oh, Eddie. Greg died. Kimbrell. Is he Eddie Taubensee. Eddie Taubensee. <laughs> Biff Pokoroba, there's a name for you oh from my the past. God. Blast oh. from the past, Braves catcher. Boy, speaking of blast from the past here, oh yeah. Every Tuesday, it's random season recall on Mackie and Judd. Declan puts us to the test with random seasons All from right, Minnesota what do we Sports got? Past. What do we got? Please tell me it's the '83 North Stars. No, oh, we're gonna we're gonna wait. We're gonna wait. We have a we have a whole system. Uh, this is my segment, so we will uh, we will <laughs> we will uh, we'll, so we'll revisit off, North Mackie. Stars. Hey, Mackadack. Yeah. <laughs> You're lucky. There's, there's you a whole list. Thing. There's a system, and I don't like when, as I as I had to deal with in Chicago, when things go awry, I start to panic. So, uh, so right. we're gonna stick to you the script what? here and rotate each one Authority down. Authority doesn't bother this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh-uh. true. It's true. Uh, we'll, we'll go with the NFL team. We're gonna go with the 2005 Vikings. Minnesota Vikings. Nine and seven. 2005 Beat Minnesota the Bears. Minnesota Vikings. Last well, day that of answers. The season. Uh, the I think we're gonna. Question. I think we're gonna fare pretty well here. This Nine is, and seven. One second, sorry. There we did it, did it, did it. There you go. Nine and seven. Paul Very Pepper, good. Brad Johnson, nice job. Mike oh, Minter, okay. Carolina. Yep. All right, hold stop. on. Uh, I'm kidding. Ne- <laughs> You're- the oh, longest, you. the longest winning streak of the season for that 2005 Vikings was. What was it? Oh, oh I like this one. Uh, I think it started. With, it started right after Brad Johnson took over because they were so, a hot mess. I believe they started like two and five, and then almost made the playoffs. Yes, they did. Yeah, because <clears> they yeah they they were. Um, they were eight and seven going into their last game. Brad Johnson reeled off something like three or, or no, it's probably more than that, Phil. It was probably was it four consecutive wins? And well, by wait the way, a second. so they were we're just talking as friends here. They um so you're saying but they finished nine and seven, so they won their last game. I'm trying yes. to think of what they the Bears didn't play people, and so they, they won that last game. So how many get? Because I'm pretty sure they started two and five. I don't know why that stands out to me. Okay. Like two and four or two and five. Well, they lost. Yeah, and they lost. So so Culpepper gets hurt at Carolina. They lose that game out of the. That was like two or three weeks after the love boat. Um, did they get it to eight and six? I think they got it to eight and six. Okay, so so here's what they did. I believe they were at eight and six with a Sunday night. Or a Sunday game scheduled against Washington at the Metrodome. I think it got flexed 
to Sunday night because it, it had playoff implications for both teams. And the Vikings lost that game. And I think that basically killed their playoff chances. Because I feel like that didn't that also happen against Washington in 2008? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, um, that no, because they made the playoffs in 2008. They uh, or 2007. I might I might be getting some seasons mixed up here. Okay, 2007. They lost. Oh, seven. They played they Washington lost at, late, and they lost to Denver as well late in that season. Well, you might be right about that. Yeah, I just okay. remember a Sunday night game. I thought it was because Brad Johnson got hot. So they definitely rattled off like five straight wins though, because they were like three yeah, and five they, or two and five. And they almost came back, yeah. Three and five, two and five, somewhere in there. Do you think it's um, five? Uh, I'm trying to think. So if they went, let's say they were three and five, did they get it to eight and five, or if it was two and five and they got it to seven and five? I just remember a late season loss. It it, it might have been in the second to last game. A late season loss, I think, eliminated them or just basically. Yeah. Killed their playoff chances. They also played the Rams late that year, and Ryan Fitzpatrick made his first career NFL start. I remember that specifically. In 2005? Mm-hmm. I thought That's it was really two- specific. I thought that was 2006. Was it? Oh, my God. This is hilarious. <laughs> Maybe it was. Because Chilk, well, wait, wait. Are, are you think? Well, wait. No, I mean, this is... You just rattled stuff. off all these facts, and now are now you you're... thinking about? Are you thinking about the? Did Fitzpatrick... Oh, oh five. They played the Ram. Did they play the Rams early in the year? Or maybe I'm wrong on this. Now I'm getting. Oh five. Awesome. They opened oh up God, against dude. Tampa. Sharper oh, Cadillac off... Williams went for uh, his only good game ever. Sharper picked off a pass that I think he returned for. I want to say the O five opener. They they might have won, and then I think they lost their second game. And then the love boat came around after the bye week, and they went in the tank for a while after that because they lost yeah. at the Bears. Yeah. The game after the love boat bye week was the Bears, and they lost that game. And then they went and played the Falcons, and they lost that game. Oh so my you, God. it might be five. I mean, you you might be right. I don't remember. Let's go five I, straight. Let's go five straight. All right. Okay, let's yes, just do be it. exact with this one. So okay, five right. straight. Come on. Yep. Damn it! Was it, was it six? Four? Six. Six. Oh, six. It was oh, a huge nice. winning streak. Yeah. So they went. Okay. Well, they keep went, asking. Keep going. They, yeah. they went two and five. They did go two then, and five. <laughs> they went two and five. After, and that was <laughs> the, 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 the Love Boat scandal in Carolina. And then they rattled off six straight wins. Home against Detroit. At New York. At Green Bay. Home against Cleveland. At yeah. Detroit. Home against the Rams. Okay. And then okay. they lost on December so, 18th. So that Rams was, game. Okay. okay. That, ra- that home against the Rams. Okay. Can you click on that game? Yes. That was either Mark Bolger at the at the end, or what did Ryan Fitzpatrick make a start? I think that was Bolger, and I think Fitzpatrick was the I thought Fitzpatrick was the next year, but you are correct, Phil. Brian Fitzpatrick. Oh Ryan Fitzpatrick. my god, dude! Oh dude. my god, with <laughs> with no beard. Hey, hey, Dex. So, dude. what? Twenty six of forty five, two hundred and thirty five yards for Fitzpatrick, no touchdowns, and. four Five interceptions. In that game. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, that's amazing. And he's still Five around to tell he did about have a rushing it. touchdown. It's Sixteen years later, and he's mm-hmm. still wow. Rocking. So Dex, out out of the bye, did they go? Did it go Chicago or did it go Chicago, Atlanta, Carolina? No, Chicago, Green Bay, Carolina. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, Atlanta mm-hmm. was right before the bye. I think that mm-hmm. that's what it was, and then they mm-hmm. had the bye. Okay. Okay. What else you got? Uh, Brad Johnson. Started. Let's see here. Let me go back here. I just want to make sure this is correct before I say it. Brad Johnson that season for the Vikings started nine games. How many did he win? Okay. Um, started nine. Wait. Uh, well, he won seven, right, Phil? Probably. Well, Got to be called, exact. So, so that they started two and five. Phil's right about that. Culpepper. And so he then the, he then started the next nine games, and then and he went he went seven and yeah he went seven and two right. So did Culpepper? Culpepper went two and five, and so they were were they two and five coming out of Carolina? Is that correct? Because I don't think Declan can answer this unless against he wants the Panthers. I I literally told you what happened just just two minutes ago. So so I yeah. Did. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't re say what. No, I no. <laughs> it's I'm true, asking yeah. Phil. So they they I think went. So. so two and five, and then they <laughs> and then he won seven. Let's go yeah. seven. Okay. seven. 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 Yep. Seven, seven. wins. Yep. Yes! 
Seven and two for Brad Johnson. Okay. By the way, two game-winning drives for Brad Johnson that season as well. So Brad was way great. To go, Brad Johnson. No arm left, but he was good. Would have had four if Greg Joseph didn't miss two field goals. No. Just a little jokey poo there. Uh, who led the team in rushing attempts that season? Who was the leading okay. rusher in attempts that All right. season? That was Moeldy Moore in the backfield. Mo Williams and Ontario Mo Smith, right? Yeah, but Ontario Smith was in and out of trouble by then. Right. So, yeah, this was like three dudes. Yeah. So that this was. Oh, Mike was Mike. Michael Bennett was still around here. Michael yes. Bennett was absolutely still around. Michael here. Bennett, Moel. Okay, Michael Bennett, Moel D. Moore. Maybe Mo Williams was gone by now. Yeah, I think no. I think he was around, but he. he I don't think he would have let him in 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 rushes. It probably. Probably Michael Bennett. If it, it feels like it would be Bennett, but are we being duped somehow? I don't think it was Moeldi because I think he was more of a special teams third down guy. Like he wasn't like a bell cow. Yeah, no. And I would and, say yeah. Bennett, Bennett or Ontario. I, and, say, I feel like Ontario because I, I thought Ontario was suspended for that season for drug use. I thought he got mm. so when so I I got on the beat in two thousand five, and I want to say during mini camp, during the summer. It came out that he had been suspended hmm. uh, because he had been pinched again. How long was he suspended? The whole year? Was he suspended for the whole year? I thought it was suspended for quite some time. I mean, it, it might be Bennett. Uh, so when did Ontario Smith have his steal of the his sod year? The, well, he was calling the, the steal of the draft. He was drafted in like what oh three or oh four. I feel like he was. I feel like he broke out when I was in Green Bay covering the Packers. And becoming a diehard Packer fan. Michael Bennett's the safe guess here. I think we're gonna find that it's like really a, close together. It's like a, better a bunch of dudes with like a hundred carries. Let's go Bennett. All right, Michael, Michael Bennett, Bennett, final yep. answer. Yep, Michael Bennett. Michael Bennett was second on the team with 126 attempts. Muel de Moore with 155 attempts. I'm sorry, that's my uh, bad. This is all God, Phil's fault. It. This is all Phil's fault. I'm about to walk um, off the show right now. I've I didn't realize this until doing doing this right now, but the player that led the team in rushing touchdowns this season, I have never heard of before. And this is in like my wheelhouse of being a Vikings fan. I've never heard of this guy. And honestly, it would be a perfect random Viking of the week. And obviously I now know whose name is and, and who he is. But this guy led the team in rushing touchdowns this season. He only played two seasons in the NFL. Vikings drafted him in the fourth round. Oh. Siatric Faison. So Siatric. Never, <laughs> never, never heard of Siatric Faison? We both never said it at the him. same time. Siatric Florida was awesome. Florida yeah. running back, really? fullback kind of a guy. Yeah, never, never heard of him. Number 35, okay. I want to say. Never, yeah. never heard of him. Wow, Siatric uh, Faison. Quickly, a couple more here. Who caught the most receiving touchdowns that season? I feel this like. This is the Nate Burleson year, wasn't it? I. Um, was it 04? Okay, I feel like. This was a year where they had that fade to Marcus Robinson quite a bit in the end zone as well. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Because mm -hmm. Childress took that out of the playbook, and that was part of the problem that le that led to the Christmas Eve surprise the next year. Um, surprise! You're surprise. cut. You're cut. You're cut. You're cut because you talked to Sean Jensen, the Pioneer Press. But um, Corin yeah. Robinson was on that team too. Corin Robinson was signed. When did he come into that team? And it was primarily as a kick returner, but then he was did it. Oh four, oh five. He was with no, the no. He was signed. I feel like he was let go because he he had the problems and went through treatment, <laughs> which obviously didn't take. And I feel like he was brought in in oh five because I remember covering when he was came to Winter Park for the first time. Um, I'm going to. I think it was Marcus Robinson, unless you right. can think of a. I mean, the only other. I think it's Nate Burleson. Well, Nate Burleson was. So, 04 was Moss's last year, and I think that was the year Burleson went for a thousand because Moss was hurt for a bunch of games. Yes, and he and he and Dante had a great connection. And I'm trying to remember if was Burleson on the Burleson had one 1,000 yard season. I don't remember how many touchdowns he had, and I can't remember if it was 04, 05. But Marcus so, Robinson seems like. A good guess. I'm going to tell you right now, too. I, I've picked up a trend here. I think the host has a trend of if it seems like the answer, it's not. I feel like he's skewing towards like trying to challenge us. Okay. And and not go with 
what seems like it should be the answer. <laughs> this is like next level psychology. Here Analytics, too, man. I'm recall. doing them constantly here at my right. house. I'll trust your, I'll trust your right. gut. Marcus, Marcus Robinson. Marcus Robinson. Oh, Robinson. look at that, dude. Yep. Wow. See? This is high level. Touchdowns. I picked up the trend. Right I picked yep. up the trend. Don't <laughs> F with me, man. I'm the Pat Bev of the show. <laughs> uh, last one. Who led the team in tackles that season? Okay, this defense. Okay. EJ Henderson. I'm trying to think of the linebackers. Oh, oh yeah, that's a good, that's a good N- one. Nap Harris, EJ Henderson, Nap and um, Harris. And then the third one was, um, oh, my God. Sam Cowart. Uh, was on this team. Sam Cowart was actually. Oh, okay, 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 okay. There was another, I just remembered there was, something. There's another one. This was this was sharper. Winfield. It, sharper. A- Antoine was on, on this team. So here's the here's the linebacker thing. This just I just uh, remember this one. In training camp, they were having EJ try to transition to the middle linebacker position, and he had a great training camp. But they had signed or obtained Sam Cowart, who, who was a veteran middle linebacker from the Houston Texans. And I think Sam Cowart started the season there, but then EJ eventually moved into that role and was great. I think you might be right, Phil. I think it might be him. I think it might be because yeah. that was the start, but before he broke his leg and it dangled in that game Dang. against the Cardinals. Um, that was the start of a really good run Be- because when I was in Green Bay, they drafted EJ and he was sort of a disaster. And and there, then there, he came along and I remember that training camp, he was he was so good that he eventually won that job. Before we say EJ is the final answer, there was another linebacker in that era, a young, it was EJ and then there was another Antarius young linebacker. Thomas? Dontarius Thomas. Okay, I don't think it was Dontarius Thomas. Okay. Dontarius I just wanted Thomas to throw once, his name out. Who once called me sir. <laughs> I got Dontarius. He's a very nice kid. He's a oh, sir. Thank you, sir. It's like, okay. whoa, dude, I am not a sir. So I would say in my order of confidence, EJ is number one. Yeah. But Antoine Winfield made a ton of tackles he in did. that era. He did. And, and he was a starting outside corner, I believe, at that point, too. He might have moved inside mm. in the nickel, but he was still starting. He wasn't just exclusively a nickel. Mm. I think um, they both probably made I think you're, so, plus tackles. I think your first choice is our best choice because I trust that a linebacker would probably just naturally make more tackles than a Especially, corner. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. EJ Henderson. EJ Henderson, final answer. EJ was third in tackles with 76. All right, Antoine Winfield. Antoine Winfield, final answer. Yes! Oh, uh, nice. tackles for so Antoine many Winfield. tackles. Nice. Yep. So many who, tackles. Who was second? Uh, the, uh, Sam Coward. There it Sam is. Coward. Okay. God, Sam we Coward were sniffing a, around there. Sam Coward mm-hmm. was a, I, mm-hmm. sniffing around. But, I mean, we just named, like, that entire starting defense. <laughs> and, then the, and then you had, um, I'm trying to think. Williams think, Wall was there by then? The Williams Wall, you didn't have Jared Allen yet, so you had Erasmus James. Konechu hadn't got sick yet. Konechu Adez, Konechu Adeza. Yeah. So you really had no pass rushers. The linebackers were Coward. Darian Scott, I think, EJ. was on the defensive line. Oh yeah, that's right. Didn't Darian Boy. Scott once like he put he was he got in trouble for he contended he was playing putting a plastic bag on his kid's head. We were just playing around. Suffocating um, my child. The oh. corners, the corners were Antoine Winfield, Kenny Irvin, Smoot. Smoot was on that team. Yeah. The safeties when did Cedric, were. When was Cedric Griffin drafted? Um, was he was good. He was yeah by well, the five. Childress administration. No, no, he he was drafted because it, it was it was Smoot, Winfield, Kenny Irvin was a veteran who, who was. On that team, the safeties were Darren Sharper. Who was the other safety? Dwight was Smith, it... I think. Was Dwight Smith there by five oh five? Brian Russell had so, been. Oh, maybe and Ticey loved him. Okay. But I don't remember if he was there in 05. Whew. Well, Damn. there it is. Random that was a tutorial on recall 2005 Vikings. Right there with Mackie and Judd. And don't you tell Declan what to do the pontificating for from Judd on that 2005 Vikings team was just... Legendary. Off the charts. Like, I'm a little disappointed just... that there was no love boat thing. No. I feel I like know. there should have been a love boat. 
connection of some sort. And I like who was on the boat, who was indicted. Yeah. You, yeah. Maybe, maybe we can do a love boat special love boat version. Random, yeah. Mo Williams. Random, random on the season boat. recall. Just the love boat. Dante, oh, yeah. Bryant McKinney. Which play? <laughs> Fred Smoot. Michael Which Bennett player had the most the boat? partners on the boat that night? Michael Bennett, my favorite story of all time, missed the boat, literally. <laughs> the story of Michael Bennett's career. Where'd everybody go, man? He, he pulled Where'd everybody up, go? He pulled up as they were pushing <laughs> off. Michael Bennett missed the boat. I'm glad you said pushing off instead of something else. All right, we got to go here. Oh, Maggie and Judd, Daily Minnesota Sports Entertainment. See you guys Pull the goalie, Judd's hockey.